Hello, and welcome to episode 3.7, the December 6th, 2023 Heart Warmer edition of Notes from the Isle Seat, the podcast that covers the arts in Northern Chautauqua County, sponsored by the 1891 Fredonia Opera House. My name is Tom Lachlan, and I'm your host as we bring you news and information about arts events at the Opera House and around the region, including interviews with artists and creators across the county. It wasn't until I began editing the interviews for this episode that I realized a theme was running through them. All of this episode's events are heartwarming stories with elements of the supernatural. From the love stories in Florencia and El Amazonas, to one man's redemptive journey in A Christmas Carol, to George Bailey's wonderful life, all three of these events will not fail to warm the heart. The beauty of these events, however, is not simply that they are heartwarming. If that's all you want, there are dozens upon dozens of made-to-heart-warm Hallmark movies for you out there. No, these stories go deeper than simply warming the heart. They get to some of the deepest truths about human existence, asking questions such as, how powerful is love? Can a person ever truly change their ways? And what difference has my life made at all? Winter is the season of contemplation, and as we move closer to the winter solstice, perhaps this is the best time of all to ponder these eternal questions as we wait for the light to return. The Live at the Met presentation of Florencia en el Amazonas brings for the first time a full-length Spanish-language opera to the Met stage. Influenced by the magic realism style of Gabriel García Márquez, this lush opera presents a tale of a love that has the power to be transformative. Dan Ijas and I had a great time getting to know this opera and its lyrical music. I am joined now by Professor Emeritus of Voice from the Department of Music, actually the School of Music, of course, at SUNY Fredonia. Uh, Professor Dan Ijas is with me, and we are going to talk about the production of Florencia and El Amazonas coming up uh, at the Opera House as part of the Live at the Met series. Welcome, Dan. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Tom. I really enjoy these uh, uh these talks that we have, especially when I don't know anything about what we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's really interesting because it, this is an opera that I think, um, I don't know whether to call it obscure or not, but I do know that it's one of those operas that's been around for a long time. Um, it was composed in 1996 by, uh, it was commissioned by the Houston uh, Opera Company and uh, the Met has has not in 100 years or more uh, produced an opera in Spanish language and they've never produced a full length opera in Spanish. So this is a big first. So it's not surprising that you don't know about it or I don't know about it or most people don't know about it because, you know, this stuff, this stuff hasn't been produced. And I think that's what uh, is going on here as far as the Met is concerned. So, uh, you know, neither of us have seen the opera yet. We've obviously, we've seen clips from the Met's website and the audience can go there and, and see those as well. But there's a lot to, th- actually, once you and I dug down into it, there's a lot to talk about. This is really quite of a fascinating thing. It's so interesting. I, I, I want to just jump back for a second. I think I read in one of the articles that uh, that I found that it was, um, it received a premiere in with New York City Opera in 2016, I think during the summer, and it was probably one of those in the in the park kind of productions. I'm not sure how well it received. It was mm-hmm. um, those are usually pretty popular, but you know, it, it's been done a lot. It was done at the Lyric in Chicago. It's been done in Europe. It's been done quite a bit, but like as you said, not until now has it been done at the Met. 
which seems odd in a way. It's gotten a lot of, it must be good enough to get a lot of play, but finally it's made its way into the Mets rep. Well, I mean, that's what that's what is interesting about the Met in this whole this whole two years that it's been pivoting away from, you know, just simply doing the the the, the standard um, repertoire that it's been doing for, you know, since its inception. Um, and and they've, they've been making a concentrated effort with, uh, you know, things like the autobiography of Malcolm X and Dead Man Walking and The Hours and and now this one um, for the Latin American audiences. And I, I, it was interesting to read. The review in the New York Times, which said it's about time that the Met did an opera in the language that 25 percent of the people in New York City actually speak. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, the New York City is a very international city, you know, and so <clears throat> there are aficionados that speak multiple languages there and so on. But it does make sense when there's a high population of people that that is their native tongue or that they speak it fluently. Why wouldn't we have this represented at the Met? But thankfully it's there now. So that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So, so let's talk about a little bit about the opera and, and what um, uh, audience audiences can e expect. And I, I think what I will do is sort of allow you to talk a little bit about the story and then the music behind it, because for as far as opera is concerned, it's always about kind of the music and the singing. Yeah, so the story is 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 kind of interesting. It's it's this sort of uh, simple story in a sense. Um, there's this opera diva. Of course, you have to have an opera diva um, mm -hmm. who uh, is living in Colombia or something like that, and she wants to come back to her homeland, Brazil. And uh, she she boards this ship. I think called the is it El Dorado? Do I have that right? You have that um, right, and and it's a steamboat. A steamboat, yeah. Um, and then there's a list of characters that get introduced along the way. But she, the idea is that they're making this trip back to to the, her home opera company in um, in Brazil. And uh, they come across this terrible storm. One of the characters falls overboard. They think he's lost, but he comes back. Um, and they they find they they meet this uh, what it's sort of a mythical character, Rio. Lobo, I think his name is. Uh, yeah, right? uh, Rio Lobo. Rio Lobo. Mm -hmm. And um, he sort of is the one that introduces the rest of the characters along the way. What I saw in the in the video clip um, on the Met website is really fantastic. The the dancers that are on the stage that are wearing these um, very uh, uh, poofy, fluffy, sort of flowing blue gowns act as the water. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and they move around the character. It's it's really quite ingenious the way they've come up with that. But uh, back to the story, I, I think one thing that was really interesting, I'm just going to read this little clip. The woman who was the uh, librettist for the opera, her name is Mar Marcella Fuentes Barrain. And she was a student of this man named Gar uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who kind of, it, it's not based on any one of his novels, but the sort of theme thematic elements of that time period um, were were steeped in sort of dreamlike magical realism. So it makes perfect sense. You know, she studied with him and has this, this in her um, DNA, let's say, and it comes out in the libretto of this piece. In any case, so there's this terrible storm. That's the high drama. That's the end of act one. And then act two, um, there, there are two sets of lovers uh, ones, ones that just meet and uh, a, a couple that's an older couple that's about to break up. And of course, they get their marriage back together by going to the opera. I mean, <laughs> who doesn't do that? Right. When Everybody your marriage is on it. the rocks, go to the opera. <laughs> <laughs> In any case. Um, and then at the end, without without ruining what happens with the story, but uh, this idea of dreamlike m m mysticism or um mythological not mythological but um mysticism i guess would be a thing to call mm -hmm. she calls out to her lost lover so the florencia is looking for her lost lover who is a uh, a butterfly hunter anyway he's lost in the jungle yes and she thinks she's lost him forever so she calls to him and or to his spirit i guess whatever and she has a metamorphosis and becomes the great emerald butterfly so that they can be together. I think it's interesting to just spend a little time talking about uh, Catan's musical influences because they're just uh, fascinating across the board. Oh my gosh. So I didn't know anything about him and I feel like 
I, I feel a little bit ignorant, like I should know this. But as you said, it's not really in our repertory. So how would we really know it otherwise? So I'm anxious to see this because I don't know anything about him. Um, what I did learn is that he uh, studied philosophy or something other than music in England and then later came back to the United States to study composition at Princeton University. And one of his teachers was Milton Babbitt. Milton Babbitt is a, uh, he's passed away now, but he, he was a major uh, influence and, and composer during the serialism or 12 tone period. 12 tone is when you take the 12 tones of the chromatic scale and you use a matrix, a mathematical matrix to come up with tetrachords um, that is how you build your composition. Mm -hmm. It seems kind of weird to make music out of math, but there's a relationship. And so Milton Babbitt was a, I mean, you maybe know this better than I do, but was, was also a mathematician. I think he worked in Washington, DC. So he was spending his time back and forth between composition and mathematics for maybe the war effort or something like that. What I think is interesting is that even though Catan studied with him and had that major influence, there is none of that in this music at all. Yes. <laughs> and so, so, I mean, I listen to those clips and I just think it's absolutely beautiful and lush. It does have those. It sounds like it could be maybe a little bit of Puccini. If you just drop the needle and you think, who, who, what composers? Wait, no, no. It sounds like Wagner. No, it sounds like, and it's beautiful. It's tonal. It is not, it is new music. 1996 was not that long ago when it was premiered. And it right. hasn't been done that often. So the music is fabulous. I love yeah. it. I think it's anyone who's going to go and hear this, you're going to in for a treat because it's new and it has fresh elements, but it is music that you can really relate to because it's very um, emotional. Yes. It sounds like what you would, what you would expect kind of from an opera if, if you were not familiar with opera at all, but it, it does have that lush romantic quality. That that whole idea of uh, romantic, I think they call it neo romantic music now. Yeah, they have to yeah, they yeah. have to stick a label to everything. But he does, <laughs> even though he's a modern composer, his spirit seems to go back more towards the turn of the nineteenth century in terms of musical style. Exactly, it's like Stravinsky in his neo romantic period. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, so, same, exactly. same idea. What about some of the voices here? I I, I was I, I listened to uh, I think her name is pronounced Aileen Perez, and uh, yes. she plays the title role of uh, Florencia, and magnificent her her final uh, the little clip of the final aria entitled Escúchame, listen to me, where she calls out to her the spirit of her uh, uh, dead lover. Um, uh, well, you know what? Very every, very every, beautiful. Every review that I that I uh, read. And then when I listened to those clips, every, everything was absolutely true. They're praising her. Even Peter Gelb was quoted, in, I think, in the New York Times as saying something. He was. It wasn't that he was opposed to having a Spanish opera of, of any kind, but he was really waiting for the right person to come along. And evidently, um, Aileen had sung something, uh, made her Met debut earlier last year or something like that. Yes. In any case... He said, she's the one he took on one day's notice. Evidently, he contacted her and asked her to sing for the Met board, this aria. And they were bowled over. Wow. And I mean, the singing that I listened to was just stunning. And that duet between uh, Arcadia and Rosalba. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Is Rosalba, out yes. of this world out of this world just stunning i mean I think well, people are going to watch for the, listen for those two things amongst other things but just fantastic yeah that duet is really beautiful because it's about the young lover rosalba's talking about you know i don't know if i should do this um it's better to be free to be a journalist uh you know just like my uh idol florencia she doesn't even know she's she's talking to she's florencia. talking to her right 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 <laughs> uh, that, that's part of the charm of the opera and then florencia says no 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 it says if you have love now grab it now because right. now is everything and don't let it get away and it is gorgeous it's a gorgeous uh duet absolutely gorgeous um aileen perez by the way is going to be singing micaela and carmen early later oh, this year. Okay. so okay. Uh, and i think that's where she made her met debut in 2015 she, she, she uh, sung the role of micaela 
I want to talk just uh, real quickly too, because you mentioned the visual elements, and I want to make sure that people oh, yeah. understand how gorgeous they are. The project. What happens is, is that the actual real uh, units that you need, like a dining room table or the actual steamboat or the deck, are very minimal. But the whole thing is surrounded by walls of lush green projections, which shimmer the whole time. And it, and and uh, the the set designer sort of made a point of wanting to create the more so the environment of the jungle the beauty of the jungle and the, the the mystical reality of the jungle and the magic of the butterflies flying through and the pink dolphins and 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 that kind of thing rather than making it realistic and and, and i think she succeeded very well i think so too i mean everything that i saw was just as you had described the one review that i read with new york city opera in the park and maybe it was because it was outdoors they were applauded for trying to bring in technology you know, and infusing it with this art form, but it didn't seem to go over very well, or at least that whoever did the review was not very impressed by it. Mm. But I've been, I've been blown away by the projections that the Met uses. And we use them here at Fredonia sometimes too, in different productions. And it's, it's, it brings a certain level of reality. So for example, Helen and I have seen um, uh, Les Mis several times. The last time we saw it on Broadway, was with R- Ramin Karimlu and they used a lot of projection projections. So when he's running away and he's in these tunnels, it looks like he's in a tunnel. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Well, I, I think audiences are really going to enjoy this just simply because it's um it's a very, very lush opera. It's visually wonderful. Um and and you know, it's a it's a good running time. It actually only runs about two hours and fifteen minutes. So you're not there forever. But I think it's it's just uh, gonna be so lush and so beautiful. And if you're in love with Puccini and that kind of uh, romantic style of operatic music, this is really a modern one for you. And I just want to put in a plug the Spanish language is one of the most beautiful languages languages in the world and for Aileen Perez to actually sing this opera in her native language right be wonderful right and I, I'm going to throw this out because I don't know if people were thinking about this but it was my initial reaction um this is not like Sarsuela or Tarzuela mm-hmm. which is a you know Spanish form of opera this is that that has spoken dialogue in it and and, so, and there are different kinds of dramatic and more lighthearted or whatever that Placido Domingo brought those sort of to us. This is not like that at all. This is a real opera in two acts done in the operatic tradition. And it, it has a lot like the Puccini esque um, qualities to it. Like Florencia would be equal to uh, Tosca, mm-hmm. you know, that her character, she, she's the tour de force of the opera. She's on stage the entire while, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a great time. Dan, as always, thank you for your expertise. Um, and and I'm I'm really glad that you had such a fun time learning about something you really didn't m- know much about coming in, and that you and I can combine our ignorance into something that you know. <laughs> hopefully, will give the audience a better look into what what's coming on that they'll enjoy at the Opera House. So, thanks a lot for that. Uh, thanks, Tom. I'm so excited to see this. I. I can't wait. I really can't. It's it's one of those things I just love. And now that I know a little bit about it, I can't wait to see what they really do. So, yeah, I'll be, I'll be there, too, because I think I'm ushering that one. So uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we'll, we'll enjoy it together. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tom. All right. Till next time, Go. Dan. Thank you so much. The Live at the Met presentation of Florencia and El Amazonas will be screened at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House on Saturday, December 9th at 1 p.m. Tickets are $20 for adults, $18 for Opera House members, and $10 for students. You can get your tickets by calling the box office at 716-679-1891 or online at www.fredopera.org. Live at the Met is underwritten with support from Daniel S. Kaufman and Timothy W. Beaver. As a younger man, I'd always been dismissive of A Christmas Carol. In the theater world, it's always been seen as the show you do to bring in the box office and help pad the bottom line so then you could do real plays. Today... I have a much deeper appreciation for the psychologically complex journey taken by Ebenezer Scrooge as he is haunted by the four spirits who visit him. 
The Main Street Studio is presenting a production of A Christmas Carol, and its co-directors Ben Sheedy and Phil McMullen joined me to dig a little bit deeper into the heart of this story. I'm joined now on the podcast by Mr. Ben Sheedy and Mr. Phil McMullen. These two gentlemen are co-directing a production of A Christmas Carol at the Main Street Studios in Fredonia, which will be presented from December 21st to December 23rd. There's going to be four performances with two on Saturday. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Hello there. Thank you so much for having us, Tom. Oh, you bet. Always a pleasure. Okay, here we go. A Christmas Carol. What more can be said? Um, I I think that um, I would probably like to start with Phil um, and get some idea from him uh, about what how this particular production is conceived. Because a Christmas Carol can be done any number of ways. You have a sm- pretty small space there, a very intimate space. So, what was the idea behind doing a Christmas Carol, and how are you approaching it from the point of view of production values? Absolutely. Um, so Main Street Studios, if you're not familiar, um, is is a small space. It's a renovated warehouse in downtown Fredonia. It's a really cool space to play, but because of the, the sort of limitations of the physical space, we have to be very creative when we look at set. We have to cre- be creative when we look at lighting. Um, so what we really wanted to focus on was the the core of the story. And so one of the the <laughs> one of the ways that we're doing that is by by bringing the pages literally to life with our set design um we'll have some some very large books on stage um and then we'll we'll be able to allow the actors to really play within that space there's always a lot of audience interaction in our productions at Main Street Studios. And so we'll break the fourth wall and interact with our our audience quite regularly as well. I think that's probably a, a, a fairly uh, a good approach. Have you have you taken the script and and um, uh, edited it down? I mean, Dickens was very famous for writing, you know, novels with words upon words upon words upon words. Sure. Um, ben, I'm going to let you actually field that one a little bit more than I have. You're you're a little more hands on with the actors right now. Um, there has certainly been some editing, but we're referencing back to the source material quite often. A lot of the text in the play is taken directly from the original source material that Dickens wrote. Um, this is an adaptation of the original novel that... Ted Sharon provided for us because he was given permission to use it from a theater company he'd worked with in the past. But everything is very true to the original source material. So there's nothing brand new. It's not like the old Vic production that came to Broadway several years ago. I think it was in 2019. And they took a lot of liberties with it. It was a beautiful production. Uh, but but this is far more traditional. One of the things that that we really want to focus on is is sort of the the inherent truths within the story that have made it endure. Um, those those truths of humanity and and Scrooge's journey. I don't want to say into corruption, but but certainly into into that that darkness and gloom, and then his journey out of it. So so we are really leaning hard into the humanity of these characters and into the humor that Dickens wrote into into the original novella as well. You know, I I I think that's a very very good approach um to this to the show because there's there's much in the show that I think over time because it's become such a holiday tradition and because it's been you know, shall we say, jazzed up in many different productions has been has has been kind of lost. Um, and I know that for the several times that I've either been in the production or directed the production, I know that's always been a challenge to be able to consistently bring out. Um, uh, ben, what do you think um, is uh, perhaps one of the, the, the singular truths that you are kind of interested in, in bringing out in the play? Well, I'll expand upon, by way of answering the question, I'll expand upon what Phil was saying to add that any kind of liberty that I might be taking would be in the execution of the text. It would be in the performance. So the characters are not 
caricatures that the actors are performing. I, I, I'm pulling as much as I can from their own personal experience and asking the narrators, for example, to bring their own personality to the part and to enjoy uh, telling the story. So to answer your question, um, I think one of my favorite facets of this story is how relatable we can find many of the characters. There's a reflection of the audience, uh, hopefully in, in every character. Um, and I really love in the original novel, how much Dickens enjoyed telling the story right off the bat. He starts with, you have to understand Jacob Marley was dead. Otherwise the story doesn't matter. And throughout the entire novel, he really, it's, it's, it's joyful the way that he tells the story. Um, and I, I think that's something really beautiful. And certainly that's why I do theaters because I enjoy telling a really good story. Um, and then all of the lessons that it includes are, are pretty, <laughs> pretty important too. I think they are too. I, I mean, th that's one of the things I've always wanted to, to, you know, get out of a production of a Christmas Carol. And for those who who are going to see it, you know, to really uh, extract some of that. I mean, I could go on and on about how I feel, but this is your production. So, uh, I mean, Phil, what are you, let me ask you this question and maybe because uh, you're not dealing with the actors so much, but you're involved in the story. How do you actually, who is Ebenezer Scrooge to you? Who is this man? Oh, Scrooge is, gosh, I don't want to say Scrooge is every man, but, but, but Scrooge is, I think the, the possibility that we all have, if, if we don't make the right choices in life, if we let others lead us astray, um, I think there's some really interesting, um, there's some really interesting clues within the text that Scrooge is, is perhaps what we would call today a child of trauma. Mm -hmm. And, and certainly that's not that's not necessarily how they would have seen it, but but Dinkins was writing during the Industrial Revolution, and and so this idea of Scrooge being sent to a boarding school, a, a distant father being pushed into the workforce at a very young age, and how that comes to color his interactions with everyone around him, the the emphasis on money, the emphasis on success of a material kind as opposed to success of a, a emotional or a, a personal kind that really resonates. Um, I think with a lot of us when we, when we look at him as a character. And so for me, that redemption story is one of, of him reliving his life, seeing what it was and seeing what it could have been instead. And, and I think the holiday season is, is that for all of us, Many of us have distant family members that we we don't connect with, and the holiday is a time for coming back and and re exploring those relationships. Yeah, I was going to say, Bell even has the line, "You want to become so rich that no one can hurt you." In so many words, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and it really humanizes his whole experience, and it makes it something that resonates for everyone. That that any this could happen to anyone under the same circumstances he's not just a caricature he's not oscar the grouch who was born this way we get to see him as a child we get to see him hopeful and vulnerable and then we get to fill in the blanks of what happened in between then and and when where we meet him at the beginning of the story yeah i think that's that's a a good thing to recognize because the I, I and i do think it's a trend that when you look at christmas carol that a lot of people are moving away from this idea of scrooge as an eminent two-dimensional villain and more as somebody who has far more depth to his to his character in uh, uh rather than just you know simply being you know a, a, a rich guy who's evil you know that's too easy mm -hmm. Um, so I, I like productions that try to tend to bring that out. The other thing about that Christmas Carol, Ben, let me ask you this question, um, is that Dickens sends up, sets up for uh, his readers a very, very clear, stark contrast between 
Scrooge and his lifestyle and uh, Bob Cratchit, the Cratchit family and their lifestyle. Um, how do you see those two particular uh, uh, lifestyles playing out uh, against each other? And um, what are you trying to do within the production to sort of bring that contrast to life? I think it's important to note both characters' priorities. Cratchit has the line a couple of times, I'm a rich man. And Scrooge is watching and he comments in our play, not on 15 shillings a week, you're not. So right there, there's a perfect example of that contrast because Scrooge values things that have monetary value and Cratchit values things that enrich one's life. And sometimes those things cost money. And I've had the thought many times that Sure, money can't buy you happiness, but it can sure stave off some of the stuff that brings you unhappiness. And these are the two personifications of those extremes uh, between Scrooge and Cratchit. So I, I think the way that I would like to see that play out is in the why. Why is it that they have two very different sets of priorities. Because then at the end, when the two kind of join together, when those two different extremes find a a middle ground, that's very often the lesson in any good story is <laughs> people tend to struggle with the idea of moderation, I think. And this is certainly a, a lesson in that there's a middle ground between those two extremes. Well, I, I, you know, I, I know I've had this conversation <laughs> with you before, Ben, so I'm going to uh, push this one over to Phil and sort of as a follow up. And well, I, I think my very favorite passage, I'm going to share, I, I can't quote it directly, but my very favorite passage is in, in the uh, Christmas present sequence where uh, the Cratchit family has had their uh, dinner and um, Scrooge has been watching. And, uh, Dickens writes this wonderful passage about how the feast is the, the Christmas dinner is sort of pictured as meager, but yet the last thing that Dickens says about it is that for the first time, everyone has had enough. And he makes a lot about this idea of people having um, enough. Do you mm -hmm. see um, Dickens kind of uh, in a sort of a, a um, you know, an indirect way, uh, uh, talking about his age, the Industrial Revolution, uh, people grabbing for more, grabbing for more, grabbing for more. Because I see a lot, I see a lot of parallels today. I mean, the people sure. just don't seem to be happy with enough. They they constantly need to have more and more, and people got to have right. side hustles. And oh my God, it goes, yeah, I go, it drives <laughs> me crazy. Right, uh, enough. Interesting word that, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's it's a fabulous concept, and and yeah, I think there's a lot of connections there. As as Ben was talking just now, I couldn't help thinking back to, um, you know, Little Women was one of my favorite books growing up, and and a lot of the themes run run very very similar. And there's this idea in there. They have uh, the most wonderful Christmas dinner, and they've they've been living on the brink of 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 poverty and and there's never enough for this family and finally there's enough and they take it to their neighbors who have even less mm. and they celebrate christmas with with this even poorer family and and in many ways this this resonated with me growing up with very little um i had a dad who was a factory worker and a mother who was unemployed so christmas was a little bit meager in our household um but somehow there was there was always enough and uh and so that that passage i think is so interesting and it is it's so relevant and i don't think it's just then and now i think it's 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 throughout the timeline of history i think again that's a theme that resonates with us all this idea of if you are sharing it with love it's enough yeah, the description of of the uh, it's fabulous. It's a great passage. It is. It's a wonderful passage. Every time I, 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 I enjoyed it. I remember the first time I actually read the novel. I think I read the novel like after two productions of having sure. done it. Maybe I ought to go read the novel. What an idiot, right, <laughs> young man? But um, 
But boy, with that passage, I remember that passage hit me like a like a ton of bricks. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just so beautifully written. Dickens writes it so beautifully. Um, one last question, just in terms of the fun of the production. There's lots sure. of special effects. There's ghosts. There's <laughs> there's you know the spirit of Christmas present is uh, got a fire going and a torch and you know all kinds of mystical magical stuff happens. And in many ways, that's a a lot uh, a part of the um you know, entertainment of the piece, let's say, if we talk about entertainment value, you, you got, you got anything going there that you want to give us a hint about that, that, uh, uh, might, uh, 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 entice us to come see the show. We've got some cool stuff planned with lighting specifically, and I'm doing my best to discover the interesting version of how the actors can play and explore and have fun because that's really kind of what it's all about so sure it's a good mix of production value but also it's really important to me that everyone has a really good time the cast and the audience mm -hmm. we're really focusing on building a community of theater in fredonia or rebuilding a, a community of theater so some of these actors have little to no experience and and the excitement at every single rehearsal is is palpable. And so for me, looking at a a fledgling theater company with with such excitement running through the cast, i'm I'm loving the process of exploring ways to create that stage magic on a dime, quite quite literally, a dime. and um and we have, as Ben said, some really fun things planned, uh, particularly with lighting. We sourced some materials today that I'm I'm really excited to uh, to bring in and start experimenting with. Oh, I can't wait to see what those are. <laughs> <laughs> well, surprise! Uh, yeah, well, you know, surprise for you and surprise for the audience, and they'll show up and find out as well. Okay, thank you so much for your time and your your wisdom and insight, and uh, I, I hope you get some full houses and have a wonderful time with the rest of the production. Thank you both. Speaking of that, I just wanted to plug the actual dates. Yeah, I do that anyway, but you can do that. Go right ahead, Ben. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, I beg your pardon. All righty. Uh, so we are performing on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of December. Yes. So we're 730 on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. We'll also be doing a matinee at 2 o'clock on Saturday, the 23rd. Okay, there you go. Four performances. All right, now I don't have to do my outro. Thank you again, gentlemen. Much appreciated. We'll see you. Thanks ya. so much for having us, Tom. Thank you, Tom. If you'd like to purchase tickets for one of the performances of A Christmas Carol, you can visit the website at www.mainstreetstudios.org backslash events and click on the link to purchase your tickets. Tickets are $15 for adults and $10 for students and seniors. Here is the arts calendar for the next two weeks. The Ecstasis Duo 2.0 Young Artist Recitals will have its final 2023 performance on Thursday, December 7th, beginning at 5.30 p.m. Young talent from the studios of the Ecstasis Duo's Natasha Farney and Eleron Abney will be performing a curated list of classical compositions from the solo and chamber repertoire. Admission is free donations are gratefully accepted. The Collage Performing Arts Center will present its holiday dance recital Christmas in Our Hometown on Thursday and Friday, December 14th and 15th, beginning at 7 p.m. at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House. All tickets are $15 and are available only through the box office at 716-679-1891. And finally, due to Opera House scheduling, we should mention here that the next Live at the Met presentation will be on Saturday, January 6th at 1 p.m. Giuseppe Verdi's Nabucco is a tale of biblical proportions set in ancient Babylon. Tickets are $20 for adults, $18 for members, and $10 for students, and can be purchased online or by calling the box office at 716 679 1891. And remember, if you have an arts event coming up and would like to get it mentioned on the arts calendar, just send us an email to operahouse at fredopera.org or call the box office at 716-679-1891 with your information. 
If A Christmas Carol is the definitive British Christmas story, then the Frank Capra movie It's a Wonderful Life has to be the definitive American Christmas story. Based on the short story The Greatest Gift by Philip Van Doren Stern, which itself was loosely based on A Christmas Carol, the story of George Bailey, who sacrifices a life of travel and adventure to help the people of Bedford Falls, New York, has become an American classic. Playwright Joe Landry cleverly adapted the original short story into a play where a 1940s radio company prepares to present a live broadcast of the story. The Lakeshore Center for the Arts in Westfield has been bringing this play to life as a gift to the residents of the region for a few years now, and I spoke with this year's co-director, Libby Cardi Chirino, to get the lowdown. This is going to be a very fun interview. I'm being joined now by um, Libby Cardi Chirino, and she is the co-director for It's a Wonderful Life, the radio play over at Lakeshore Center for the Arts in Westfield at the Old Presbyterian Church. Libby, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you bet. It's wonderful to have you. Um, as I as I uh, said, uh, you know, before we started the recording, this is one of my favorite plays because I have such an affinity for radio. And most people will understand that it's the uh, uh, live version of the movie. It's a Wonderful Life. Um, yes. And it tells the same story, but it tells it with a troop of people who are at a radio station in the 1940s. And they are, um, you know, on the air live uh, doing their thing. Um, so can you give us a little bit of a rundown of how you've uh, decided to approach the play? Well, um, the origins of us starting this play was quite fun. Um, this play we started before the theater was even uh, realized. Uh, Rick Mascaro, of course, it was his dream, his baby, and the theater was developed, well, I think we started in 2020. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, we started this play, doing this play in 2016, and our rehearsals were actually in a barn, in Kelly Matthews' barn. So we would all gather there, and um, we would, you know, just imagine that we were in a 1940s uh, studio, and our practices were just a blast. Mm -hmm. And since we didn't have a theater at the time, we were we went everywhere with this. We uh, played down at the Harbor House down here in Westfield when it was, I think it was Zebros at the time. We did dinner theater with it for a couple times. We also did it out at the Great Discovery um, Center. We moved out there and did it there. Um, we did it at the Patterson. I think we did it at the Patterson Library. Um, so we were kind of a traveling troupe at the time mm -hmm. and it worked out really well and it was very popular. Oh, we also did it at the Episcopal church and at the Presbyterian church. And it was so well received that when the theater was built, we thought, wow, this theater is the perfect venue because it's just the perfect size. And we had such, we have such a great group of people that do it and, um, so that, that's how it kind of all came about. And now we do it as a gift every year to the community as a, a Merry Christmas gift and kind of get everybody in the Christmas spirit. And that's that's what we do now with this play. And it's a wonderful play. And it sure makes everybody smile. When I look out in the audience, they're, um, they're, they're, you're, when you're in the audience in this play, you are an actual... Um, kind of a participant because we do a 1940s radio show, but we're doing it in front of a live audience like they would have then. Uh, we do our own jingles, which are fun. Uh, we could see the big smiles on people's faces. And at the end, we sing together, Old Lang Syne, and everybody joins in on that also. And uh, we get a lot of laughs and you could always see some tears. So it's a very great, uh, great story. Yeah, it's a, it really is a wonderful production. I'm, I'm particularly, uh, I, I always get, a, I, like you, I always get a kick out of the jingles because the jingles are designed to be um, written and you put local business names into the jingles as opposed to something that's generic or anything like that, which which really adds a nice touch. Um, so uh, 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 tell me who's playing whom here. I, I have your cast list uh, in front of me, but, you know, you 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 have a nice cast of uh, uh, people. Who's Who's playing whom here? Well, um, John Daly is playing George Bailey. He's he is George Bailey as far as I'm concerned. I think he does an amazing job with that character. 
And new to us this year is Diane Scarpine, who will be playing Mary. And then we have Doc Hamels, who uh, has a, his radio show, uh, mm -hmm. sun, um, Chautauqua Sunrise, every mm -hmm. Saturday morning. He is Do uh, he's Freddie Fillmore. He's the announcer, and he's fabulous. And he plays a lot of little parts throughout the play. The same as I do the same. Um, I'm Violet Bick. I'm uh, Mrs. Hatch, who is Mary's mother. Um, I play some men parts, actually. And I play Little Zuzu, if everybody remembers Little Zuzu <laughs> in the in the movie. Her petals, and, her rose petals. Um, we have Zuzu's petals. And then we have uh, Rick Matthews, who is new to us. Not new to the theater, but new to the play. He's playing Joseph. And uh, Clarence is actually played by Barb Johnson. She's been with us the whole time. And Joni uh, Mascaro, uh, Joni Caruso Mascaro, or Mascaro Caruso, which is Rick Mascaro's sister, she will also be new this year in, in this production, and she plays a multitude of different parts. And so does Kelly Matthews, who is my co-director, and he plays Harry Potter. You're going to love to hear him do that. And uh, a bunch of other little parts, too. So all of us together. Oh, and Karen. Can't forget Karen um, Cockrum. She's our folly girl. She's the one who does all of the actual sound uh, effects like you would have seen in the, the actual um, radio show back then. You, there's uh, the sound effects. She's got uh, the splashing of the water. We have like a bucket with a with a plunger. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many different ways to, to make all these wonderful sounds on the radio. And then we have Judy uh, Waite, Judy Washington Waite. She is going to be doing sound and lighting up in the booth. And uh, Kelly Matthews was really key in really getting together our um, our sound and tech. And he does he does a wonderful job setting the theater for our show. So uh, uh, tell me a, a little bit about how you've transformed the space. I know Kelly Matthews is a he's very very good with tech and stuff like that. You know he's he works it he works it very well. Do, are you going to have um, the whole kind of you know radio thing uh, set up with the booth and the big sign and stuff like that? Oh yes, there's going to be a big applause sign that will be lit up every time for the for the audience. Um, all the microphones are all 1940s microphones. And we all dress in 1940s outfits. Mm -hmm. And so the studio, it's, it's going to look like a 1940s studio. And of course, we have our wonderful, beautiful uh, red velvet curtains. Yes. that really ties that in with the whole the whole Christmas theme. Is, I mean, they're always there. But to me, it just feels very Christmassy. And um, how the theater started was Rick Mascaro's baby and he got a lot of grants, a lot of people together, a lot of volunteers. And uh, Rick Matthews is a very talented, talented carpenter and builder. And we actually um, rent the third floor of the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. Mm -hmm. But we have run of the whole third floor. So a theater was built there. And Rick Matthews was kind of key in, in building that too. And there was a lot of people who did a lot of hard, hard work. And it's turned out to be a fabulous looking theater. It's so professionally done. And I yeah. encourage everybody to come see the theater. Just if you can't make it to our, our production next Saturday, which is the 9th at two and at seven, if you can't make it, you're always welcome. Every Saturday, we are open from 11 until 3. And you can see our art gallery. You can see um, the whole theater. And you'll get a grand tour. And it's a really nice space. And we've had a lot of compliments. And we've had a lot of people join as members also. So, Yes, I know. I, 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 w I had the same reaction as just about everybody that I know. Is I walked into that space for the first time, and it blew me away. I, I was 
so thoroughly impressed by what I saw. And I really had not expected that. It's just, it's a well-constructed, beautiful little, it's small space, but it's perfect size. I mean, I, I, I think that that's a wonderful uh, uh, place to be. And I do think audiences are really going to enjoy it. Now, now l let me make sure I understand this right, get this information out to the audience. This is, um, this is free. Admission is free. Is that correct? Admission is free. It's a gift to the community. And of course, there's always a, you know, a donation. <laughs> okay. If you to, but if not, that's fine too. We want you to bring the family. It is going to be first come, first served um, because ticket sales are not needed because there's no sales right. with them. So um, please come early. Uh, let's see. I think our theater holds between about between 40 and 42, 43 people. Um, I think that's at capacity. So uh, I would get there a little bit early. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to suggest. If it, you know, if people get there, um, you know, right at the door because there's no advanced sales and you're just going to have to be standing online or whatever it is to walk into the theater. And it is a small space. It's a limited space. So you do want to get there early to make sure that you have a you you um, have a great time over there. I mean, I, I think it's going to be uh, wonderful um, just so that people know what's a uh, what's a, the approximate running time. Usually that thing runs about 75 to 90 minutes or so. Yes, I'd say about 90 minutes. Uh, there is a short 10 minute uh, intermission. So you can get up and stretch your legs. Mm -hmm. um, with the intermission, it's probably a little over an hour and a half, but it moves along very well. Um, I think because of the story itself, uh, I, pe I think people really get engrossed into the story and you don't even realize you're there for an hour and a half just because it's just so much fun. And and like I said before, there's a lot of laughs and, and there's some tears just because it's so heartfelt because, you know, George really does a transformation in that story um, himself yeah. and realizes, you know, life is so precious and how he affects other people in such a wonderful way. So I think you walk out of there really feeling, feeling good. You really get that Christmas spirit when you leave. Well, no matter how many times I see the movie, it, it it's always the same. It's always like just kind of a uh a, a wonderful heart heartwarming thing and you know lately there's so many things that don't warm the heart that it's always a good opportunity to go to something <laughs> that does warm the heart <laughs> absolutely absolutely oh and i do want to say uh if anyone is a little nervous that that it uh the play of uh, our theater is on the third floor we do have a chair lift that you can sit on and it just takes you right up the stairs. So if that would make people a little nervous to hear that it was on the third floor, there is a chairlift. So you do not have to walk up all those flights of stairs. That's there's three great. flights, but yeah. they're short. Yeah, the handicap accessible. Yeah, that's a good thing to note. Libby, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I know that the people in Westfield and the surrounding area are really going to appreciate the gift that you're giving them because this is just a wonderful thing that you're doing free admission for uh, such a, a, a wonderful little piece of theater. So thank you for that. And thank you for your time uh, talking to me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Tom. It was nice seeing you again. And and you have a great day. You know, this next weekend. <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've got it in my head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, Libby. All right. Thank you. It's a Wonderful Life, the radio play, will be presented at the Lakeshore Center for the Arts in the Jacqueline Phillips Theater at 49 Portage Street in Westfield on Saturday, December 9th only. There will be two performances, one at 2 p.m. and another at 7 p.m. Admission is free. Seating is on a first-come, first-served basis. Donations are gratefully accepted. And before we end this episode... I want to take this opportunity to put in a plug for membership at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House. The Opera House is a non-profit organization and as such relies on funding from a number of sources. The most important source happens to be its members. The people who make donations to the Opera House above and beyond ticket purchases. From the cinema series to Live at the Met to the stage on screen performances to the art and architecture series. The Opera House brings high-quality arts events to the region that for most of us would be impossible to see otherwise. 
Most people I know do not have the funds to be able to travel to London to see the National Theatre, or to Amsterdam to see an exhibition of Vermeer masterpieces, or even to New York City to see an entire season at the Met Opera House. Yet for a mere $35, you can support a venue that presents all these events in high-quality HD video and Dolby surround sound. That, my friends, is a steal. And to top it off, not only does membership provide you with discounted ticket prices to selected events, but it is also tax-deductible. There are levels of membership that you can view by going to www.fredopera.org backslash support hyphen us and checking them out, as well as the increasing perks that come with higher membership levels. The Opera House is grateful for every single member out there. If you're a member, thank you. If you're not yet a member, please consider getting a membership for the 2024 season before the year is out. You'll be glad you did. And I also want to give a shout out to all my fellow 1891 Opera House ushers. They are the unsung heroes of the Opera House as they volunteer their time over and over again to make coming to events at the Opera House a comfortable and joyous experience for our audiences. I'm pretty proud to be a member of this great group of people, and they deserve all our thanks for what they do. If you'd like to become an usher and enjoy the perk of seeing events for free, call the box office at 716-679-1891 and let Marcia know you're interested. She's always looking for more volunteer ushers. And that's it for this heartwarmer edition of Notes from the Isle Seat. My thanks to Ben Sheedy, Phil McMullen, Dan Ehas, and Libby Carty Sherino for being my guests on this episode. Notes from the Isle Seat is a production of the 1891 Fredonia Opera House in Fredonia, New York. For more information on any of the Opera House's events, call the box office at 716-679-1891, visit the website at www.fredopera.org, or email at operahouse at fredopera.org. Notes from the Isle Seat is now available wherever you get your podcasts, and also on the Opera House YouTube channel. If you like this podcast, please consider following us by clicking the follow button on our home website at aisleseat.podbean.com and spreading the word through your social media feeds. If you have an arts event you'd like featured on the podcast, why don't you drop us a line at operahouse at fredopera.org and we'll see about getting your event featured on the podcast. Please try to give us a month's advance notice if possible to facilitate timely scheduling. If you have any suggestions, comments, or criticisms of the podcast, just drop us a line at operahouse at fredopera.org. We'll be glad to receive your feedback. Our next episode will be available on Wednesday, December 20th, 2023. I'm Tom Lachlan, and until then... Be safe out there and be kind to one another.